Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for coming. It's a pleasure to see you. Um, the purpose behind uh, these lectures uh, is uh, really to give you a sense of what it is, or one of the things that we do uh, at the Center for Jewish Studies. Um, we teach, we teach undergraduates and we teach graduates. And uh, in those long breaks, when people who are not academics think that we just get interminably long holidays, uh, what we do is we write and research and write. And uh, what I'm gonna present to you today is uh, the product of uh, many long summers and long winter breaks um, on a subject that is uh, very dear to me, and that is the history of uh, medicine among the Jews in Germany. Now, <clears throat> since antiquity, medicine has played a role in the sort of central role in the um, uh, religious, social, and cultural life of the Jewish people. So there's an admonition in the Babylonian Talmud, for example, uh, that one should not live in a town without a physician all the way to more modern uh, concerns or much vaunted concern that Jews are said to express for their health. And those they, they, that deep concern Jews have for their health is very um, deeply embedded in the folk culture and languages uh, of the Jews. And so there's a very rich story to be told about the history of Jews and medicine. Um, even the sort of the stereotype of the Jews who were um, believed to be uh, predisposed uh, to becoming doctors, good doctors, uh, was a, is a major trope that we will uh, explore. But uh, in Germany, uh, there were so many Jewish doctors, and I'm going to talk about this soon, uh, that even uh, even the anti-Semites were first forced to um, uh, recognize the supposed aptitude the Jews had for um, had for medicine. And so there was a very famous joke. It's hard to tell jokes on Zoom because I can't hear a response, but I'm going to try anyway. So a beloved joke among German Jews was that um, uh, there is uh, an anti-Semite in a hospital bed in the ward. And then a Jew is, uh, uh, a Jew is admitted and uh, is in the next bed. And the very next morning, a Jew comes in in the evening and the very next morning he gets up and he lays tefillin. And the anti-Semite says, you see, the Jew boy's only been here one night and he already knows how to take blood pressure. And that was a joke that German Jews just loved. They had a, there were hundreds of these medical jokes. Anyway, in particular, telling the history uh, of this intimate relationship as it unfolded in the modern period allows us to see how Jews um, used medicine uh, as a uh, as a tool to fashion modern Jewish identity and Jewish ideologies to promote social change and even to modify individual behaviors of Jews. Um, when we get to the modern period, the focal point of this history of Jews and medicine is in Germany. And the reason that Germany is the focal point is because no pre-war Jewish community produced more scientists and doctors. No Jewish community produced more medical literature on Jews. And no Jewish community defined itself by how many scientists and how many doctors it produced to the extent that German Jewry did. And this was especially the case in Berlin and Vienna. And so my central argument is that medicine uh, is not just a purely scientific affair but it was also a cultural one as well. And it proved central to the formation and subsequent character of modern German Jewry. And so to explore that uh, claim, I'm gonna focus on three developments uh, spanning the 18th century through to the 20th century. Uh, historians consider the beginning of the modern period in Jewish history around the 18th century. Uh, so, and these three developments are, are ones that I take as being illustrative uh, of that process where medicine was linked to the transformation of German Jewry from a pre-modern into a modern people. The first one is the emergence of the modern Jewish doctor 
uh, during the Jewish Enlightenment or the Husk. I want to look at the social and cultural impact of medicine uh, on German Jewry by the early 20th century. So the first one about the uh, modern Jewish doctor, the emergence of the modern Jewish doctor. So medicine's role uh, in the transformation of German Jewry began with the advent of the modern Jewish doctor in the 18th century. Now he differed significantly from his uh, medieval and early modern uh, predecessors because he was not a hybrid character. And by hybrid character, I mean a rabbi and a doctor. So the most famous of which was someone like Maimonides, both rabbi and doctor. Rather, the modern Jewish doctor who emerges in the 18th century only sees himself as a man of science. And that's illustrated by the fact that the first central European, let's say German speaking, Jewish intellectuals from German lands, actually, uh, Jewish speaking intellectuals to not to not attend a yeshiva were German Jews who chose instead to go to university and study medicine. And that was a step that was taken by about 500 Jews between 1721 and 1800. And this served to help radically change the face of German Jewry because the attainment of social status would no longer come through the mastery of rabbinic texts, but through a combination of commercial and professional success and perched very high on the ladder of Jewish social accomplishment and authority was the physician. So it's during the Jewish enlightenment of the 18th century that uh, Jewish doctors first become um, deeply influenced by contemporary European, especially German standards of physical and moral perfection. And they begin to uh, publish texts exhorting Jews uh, to take care of themselves. Now this also differed significantly from previous generations of doctors like Maimonides. Maimonides wrote scores of medical treatises, but he doesn't mention Jews in them at all. He just speaks about medicine. Right, just speaks about medicine and the human body per se. Uh, in contrast, modern Jewish doctors, as I define modern Jewish doctors uh, here, uh, are those who um, were concerned uh, about the health of the Jewish people, who were in some way uh, for whom Jewishness, either in a positive sense or from the anti-Semitic perspective, a negative sense, uh, played a, a role in this story. Um, many of the doctors in the 18th century were critical of traditional Jewish society, many of these Jewish doctors, and believed that modifications had to be made to the traditional lives of Jews uh, in order to uh, assist with their physical and mental well-being. And as such, Jewish physicians were actually in the vanguard of promoting uh, social reform, uh, aspiring to lead Jewish society in place of the rabbis. The doctors argued that uh, beneficent Christian rulers would be more likely to uh, bestow legal emancipation on Jews uh, if they were healthy and productive. Now, just as a little bit of background, the Jews were not an emancipated people. They were legally, in Central Europe, they were legally, uh, they weren't legally emancipated really until 1871. Uh, and even then it wasn't full emancipation until 1918. So <clears throat> at the period that I'm talking about in the 18th century, the Jews were not an emancipated people, but Jews were desirous of being, and obviously having you know, all these legal disabilities removed from them and then becoming citizens. And uh, Jews made lots of strenuous efforts to try and prove themselves worthy of emancipation. Uh, and one way was to produce, you know, to make themselves seem healthy and productive. Uh, one physician, a man by the name of Elkan Isaac Wolf, uh, published a medical treatise in 1777 called On the Illnesses of the Jews. 
And in which he says, a Jewish community that through the benevolent decrees of a humanitarian ruler is granted small civic privileges intended to keep them healthy becomes like a productive mine where the treasury department can exploit gold and silver from even the most unpromising strata. So money talks and Wolf the doctor says, listen, it's better for the state if you have healthy productive Jews who are not restricted in their various occupations. And there were just hundreds and hundreds of restrictions against Jews doing this job or that job. If you emancipate them and therefore the shackles are off, and they can engage in any sort of occupation they like, they will become this uh, mine that can be, uh, or, you know, a gold mine for the treasury. Now, the unproductiveness of Jews was a, was a you know, what the problem was is that Jews were, 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 were not allowed to do this job or that job, and then they were accused of being unproductive. So it was a catch-22. But the unproductiveness of Jews was held by many to begin already in childhood. And figures in the Jewish Enlightenment, called Masculine, uh, tended to agree, attributing the problem to the ill effects of tradition, the traditional Jewish educational system. One physician uh, who was from Poland, but educated in Germany, got his medical degree in Germany, was a man by the name of Moshe Marcuse. And Marcuse also wrote a, uh, a treatise, uh, wrote a, actually a thick book uh, in Yiddish in uh, 1790 uh, called the Book of Remedies. And he includes this a very sarcastic description. We men, we men, the fathers, have a lovely custom with our little boys in Poland. When they turn four, we send them to prison to the elementary school teacher. And when the child has already been imprisoned for a year with his Aleph Beit teacher, they release him from the Siddur, and now he must go to prison with his Gomorrah teacher. And here he no longer has time to pray, let alone study the Bible, but only Gomorrah and more Gomorrah. You make your children pale, yellow, green. They cannot sleep well, hence they do not grow. And many common men are afterwards mistaken about their children. They think they are already scholars just because they have pale faces. Now, this is a very important point. Because in traditional Jewish society, the ideal appearance for a male is to have been pale. Because pale denotes someone who has been inside studying. It's a sign of moral health, ethical health. And so, again, there's always a joke about everything, but uh, it's Krakow and it's 1920 and a father and his small son are walking down the street and around the corner <clears throat> comes this huge strapping pole, a magnificent specimen of a human being. And as the father and the son walk past this gigantic man, the father gives his son a clip across the back of the head and says, see, if you don't study, you're gonna end up looking like that. There's a very, very different masculine sort of ideal of what, the, what a, an ideal male should look like between Jews and non-Jews in traditional society. Marcuse and many other uh, like-minded Jewish doctors uh, were also deeply unnerved by uh, the people from whom Jews got their medical care. Uh, they were distraught over Eastern European Jewry's uh, reliance on barber surgeons, uh, known in Yiddish as felches and other practitioners of folk medicine. Now, Marcuse was the bearer of a prestigious medical degree from Königsberg, and he wished to tear Jews away from their reliance on these barber surgeons, he called them charlatans, and have them turn to university educated, socially superior medical practitioners uh, such as himself. Uh, by the way, in the 18th century, there's absolutely zero difference between the treatment uh, you would get from a barber surgeon uh, or a folk healer, faith healer, and someone who had a medical degree from a university. Uh, neither of them could do very much for you. It could set some bones or something like that. Anyway, Marcuse was uh, very specific about what should happen to unlicensed medical practitioners. And I say again, 
may those who publicly kill people and no one prevents them from doing so have their names wiped out. They should take a lesson from the non-Jewish world. One does not hear of such debauched characters dragging themselves about and openly killing people. Unfortunately, many of the murderers clothe themselves because of our sins in the garments of rabbis and have a bit of learning. They kill even more people. Punish them. May their names be blotted out and may they be condemned to death by burning. So in the fullness of this very sort of violent, angry passage, Marcuse expresses his desire to restrain those he deems unqualified to administer health care. And in lieu of a state apparatus, there's no apparatus for Jews, he insisted that the Jewish community monitor, prosecute, and punish the alleged offenders itself. Now, it wasn't just in Poland that such a thing happened. It was also in Germany. Uh, a man by the name of Markus Hertz, who was a physician at Berlin's Jewish hospital, expressed something very similar. In uh, 1789, he wrote a Hebrew prayer called A Prayer for the Physician, in which he cries out to God and he says, remove from the bedside of the sick every quack doctor, every large entourage, all the heralds and the saviors who pretend to know, who dare to rise up and criticize the work of a doctor, for they are a vile people. And what he's talking about there is the family gathered around the bedside, telling the doctor what to do in sort of some of typical Jewish fashion. Returning to Marcuse, he railed against in particular midwives and drunken Hasidic faith healers. Now, uh, among their enemies, their opponents, uh, the Hasidim uh, in the 18th century had a reputation for being drunkards. Uh, and he, this is what he's referring to. Uh, the book that he wrote, this book of remedies is extremely rare. I think there are only about four copies. Uh, the one that I used was at the Jewish Theological Seminary in New York, but there are only about four copies left in the world because the Hasidim, this book published in 1790, bought up every copy they could find and cast them into the flames. So it's an extremely rare text. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> now, the thing that's uh, consistent with all the in Jewish Enlightenment era medical text is that they make Jewish behavior and the health of the Jews exceptional. No one hears about faith, faith healers among the Christians, says Marcuse. Absolutely nonsense. They had tons of faith healers, uh, folk med, folk, you know, issuing folk remedies. Um, Ma, you know, Marcus, uh, uh, the prayer that Marcus Hertz writes, uh, you would think the Jews are the only ones standing around the bedside of the sick, uh, you know, kibitzing, but that's obviously not true. Um, in 1775, I'll give you an example. Uh, there was uh, the Royal Society of Medicine in France um, presented a question uh, to be discussed by the learned doctors about the, um, about the diet of the Jews. And the upshot of the report that was delivered to the Royal Society in 1775 said, look, the Jews are unhealthy because they have a predilection an unnatural predilection for pastries and sweets. Now, okay. Now, remember that this is France. So if you believe that it's only the Jews who have a hankering for fine patisserie and good croissants and good bread, then you're kidding, kidding yourself. But the point is here is to isolate Jewish behavior to make it seem as though no one else is doing this, that the Jews are sort of alone in this sort of abnormally unhealthy world, right? So they exclude the fact that everyone's doing very, very similar things. The second category I want to look at is that uh, the 19th century and the representation of Jews in uh, medical literature in the 19th century. Uh, the rise uh, of uh, anti-Semitism in the 19th century saw Jewish practices uh, come under a certain assault uh, in the belief that they were barbaric or that they were separatist. And so we see uh, attacks on uh, the 
Jewish dietary laws on, uh, on uh, the ritual bath, uh, the mikvah, or shechita, the Jewish animal slaughter. And here we see something very different from what we saw in the 18th century. So where the Jewish doctors in the 18th century were criticizing various Jewish institutions, like the Jewish school, or those who service the community providing health care, in the 19th century, in the face of this sort of anti-Semitic onslaught against Jewish ritual behaviors, doctors step into the breach, Jewish doctors, and defend all of these practices as being extremely healthy and extremely positive things, be it circumcision, or be it ritual animal slaughter, or be it, you know, the, uh, uh, going, to the going to the ritual bath. All of these things were pre presented as uh, positive. And the background to this is that, as I said before, the Jews are not yet an emancipated people. So the debates that took place in Germany about should the Jews be emancipated, can we emancipate them, all turned on the, the belief uh, by the opponents of emancipation that these behaviors, these oriental behaviors, right? So things like circumcision and the way they slaughter their animals, et cetera, et cetera, uh, unbecoming and underfitting uh, membership in a modern European state. Uh, <clears throat> and in the context of this, one of the things that was raised as a possible uh, objection to emancipating the Jews, there was a widespread belief that the Jews are even constitutionally or physically incapable of the transformation uh, of becoming European even though that's where they're from. But it was in the 18th and the early 19th century, the Jews were not considered European, but actually some kind of Oriental, Asian type of person, right? someone from the Middle East. Um, so what we see is the creation in the, in the, um, in the 19th century of uh, an enduring Jewish type, and that is the sickly Jew. Uh, and the sickly Jew, the sort of the, the kind of the nebbish, right? The kind of stereotypical Jewish male, the kind of the Woody Allen type character. None of that ever existed before the 19th century. Of all the anti-Semitic things that were said for centuries and centuries and centuries, there was very little comment. There was no comment that the Jews were an unhealthy people. That's a real factor of the modern period and a feature of the modern period. Uh, and it's something that uh, not just anti-Semites, but uh, people, uh, Jews as well, across the ideological spectrum, begin to internalize those stereotypes. Zionists certainly uh, internalize them, saying that we're going to leave and we're going to create a healthy Jew, working the land, tilling the soil, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But assimilationists also, the very opposite of the Zionists, the assimilationist Jews also said, in order to prepare ourselves for emancipation, we have to make ourselves healthy. Now, and it was in German medicine that this stereotype uh, really uh, flourishes, takes root. Uh, now, especially in the background of this is that within the 19th century, it's an age of empire where robustness and virility were seen as the true hallmarks of national greatness. But Jews were bereft of the most normative and basic trappings and attributes of uh, nationhood, a common language, a defined territory, a flag, a national anthem, and a standing army. Jews represented the antithesis of European nations. They're seen as corrupt, uh, urban, uh, a countertype to the healthy, supposedly healthy peasantry with a noble agricultural tradition, or a knightly warrior class, all further sort of signifiers of European rootedness. Um, so the degree to which lots of Jews internalized that those stereotypes should not be underestimated, and they made their way in, into medicine. Uh, a famous, for example, uh, I mentioned Zionists before, you all know the story, they should go and work the land, work the fields. Uh, but among them, the civilizationists. So a guy by the name of Walter Rattenau. Rattenau was um, from a, an enormously wealthy Jewish family. Uh, his father owned 
nothing less than the German equivalent of German, uh, General Electric, AEG. Uh, but he was also, Walter Rupp, now the son, was an intellectual. He eventually became the foreign minister uh, and was assassinated by right-wing nationalists in 1921. But in 1897, he wrote uh, a, uh, an essay called Hero Israel, in which he says, and he talks to Jews, he says, as soon as you have recognized your unathletic build, your narrow shoulders, your sloppy rounded shape, you will resolve to dedicate a few generations to the renewal of your outer appearance. Now, that could have come in some respects from the Zionists, but it actually comes from the assimilationists. So the Jewish body was attacked from all sides by anti-Semites and different points on the Jewish ideological spectrum. But there's a problem. That's a really big problem. If you look at, as I have done, 19th century medical literature, you have a very odd situation. Because despite the perception of Jews as being unfit and unwell, the statistical findings on Jews, and there were tons of them that were done, show Jews to have been an extraordinarily uh, healthy people. Everywhere, if there was such a thing as a Jewish pathology, then on first blush, it was a positive attribute. Statistics taken from just about every country showed that Jews lived longer than non-Jews. They had a significantly lower infant mortality rate. They had a lower death rate. And they seemed to be far less subject to some of the more common diseases of the day. And yet, in spite of all the evidence indicating that the diaspora produced healthy, virile, and vibrant Jews, it suited the political agendas of a host of anti-Semites uh, and ideologues across the Jewish spectrum to create a counter image to the healthy Jew of social reality and portray him as, and it's usually him, as, uh, as unwell. Uh, so medicine ignored most of its own statistical findings on Jews. And how do they do that? So I want to look at three diseases briefly to show uh, how those diseases uh, address Jews. Uh, to try and arrive at an understanding of how a Jews could both be represented as healthy and sickly at the same time. Uh, <clears throat> and the, the key to the puzzle is gender, uh, because diseases are gendered. Diseases themselves are gendered, and they're still gendered. And just to give you an example before I begin, uh, if I say, breast cancer, most people immediately think of women. But the fact of the matter is men also get it. But the immediate cultural association, and there's a higher incidence among women too, but it is not just a women's disorder, but that's what we uh, think of. So the gender still plays, plays a role. So of all the studies that were, the first one I wanna look at is alcoholism because of all the studies that, uh, uh, done by physicians and social critics, alcoholism was the subject par excellence in which Jews in the medical literature are compared to non-Jews. And for nearly all of those who recognize the statistical good health of the Jews, right, uh, they always attributed to the lack of alcoholism in Jewish society. So while never uh, total abstainers, Jews as a group, generally speaking, have never been overindulgers. And there are infinitesimally low rates uh, of alcoholism among Jews. And I'm not gonna get into the reasons for that now, uh, but however, it's a curious uh, representation of Jews in the 19th century medical literature um, that uh, even when they're praised for being uh, sober, uh, this heralds their kind of abnormality because Jews reside alone, isolated outside behavioral and pathological norms. Uh, now, what I mean by this is that uh, drinking is an enormously important part of European culture, male culture. And if Jews are not engaging in it, then there is something wrong and it further instantiates the idea that Jewish men are not real men because they don't drink to the excess 
of non-Jews. And I'll give you two examples. Uh, French anti-Semites attacked the nation's two Jewish prime ministers uh, relentlessly uh, because of their beverage preferences. Uh, Leon Blum in the 1930s uh, generally opted for water. And uh, Pierre Mendes France would uh, stand on the floor of the National Assembly and hold up a glass of milk, touting the health benefits of milk. Now, in a country of wine drinkers, this was seen as evidence of their lack of patriotism, evidence of their of the in, their, their sort of inherent inability to truly be French and celebrate French culture. I want to read you one description from uh, 1902. There's a Zionist lawyer from Germany by the name of Arthur Rupin. Uh, if you go to Israel today, every city has a Rupin Street. And Rupin tells us of his in his memoirs about the role of drink in lubricating social relations. It's 1902, and he starts work that day. He's uh, you know just a recently graduated law student, and now he's on his first day on the job. And uh, he's met at the train station by his employers who take him back to the office. It's 10 a.m., he says, and the morning drinking hour was fast approaching. So they went to a nearby hotel where Rupin was addressed, uh, introduced to his new colleagues. And he says, they gave me a warm welcome and were apparently satisfied with me and my drinking habits that I had learned at university. I drank five to six glasses of beer to make the proper toasts to each one of them. Afterwards, I had to drink wine with my lunch at the hotel, and my head was heavy at five o'clock when I made my way to the court to take the oath. And then Rupin tells us at this stage that his colleagues were still unaware that he was Jewish. I don't believe that for a minute. I'm quite sure they knew. But soon after he declared and made it known that he was Jewish, he says that when the early evening hour of drinks began, and the amount of drinking is just beyond belief, but the, 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 uh, when, the, when the time for early evening drinks arrived, Rupin reports that the atmosphere turned freezingly polite. Pretending not to notice, he proceeded to drink with them. By the nighttime round, he reports that a concerted vindictiveness had set in. And he noted that they had intended to drink me under the table. At university, I'm not used to drinking a few glasses of beer, but on this evening, I was obliged to down a total of 22 glasses. And this had a devastating effect on my intestines. I felt terribly sick, but I did not let it show. I continued to sit up straight in my chair, apparently not at all drunk, and decided I would burst rather than give in. At one o'clock in the morning, the district judge left the pub apparently reconciled to his apprentice, that was him, who could hold his liquor. Now, we will never know how many others, and this is a very vivid description that Rupin has left us, but we'll never know how many other Jewish males found themselves in a similar predicament. I dare say all of the Jewish lawyers and many of the Jewish doctors and many professionals in the workplace. Um, and a peculiar form of Jewish male domesticity related to the aversion to drunkenness was also reported by physicians. Uh, medical literature always characterized the Jewish home as a bastion of gentleness and sobriety and love. Obviously they had spent much time in Jewish homes, but nonetheless, uh, the accuracy of the statement is not, is not important. Um, what counts is the medical perception of such behavior. Doctors often commented, non-Jewish doctors, of course, often commented on the oddity that in Jewish homes, it was not men who ruled the roost. The image of Jewish men as effeminate was reinforced thanks to the fact that they were sober and it was their women who were in charge. The second disorder that I want to look at is diabetes. Now, in contrast to alcoholism, Jews were believed to suffer inordinately from diabetes. Uh, it, so much so that in German, it was colloquially known as the Judenkrankheit, the Jews' disease. German Jews, again, had a joke for diabetes. And it goes like this. Nebuch, we Jews cop it from all sides. When a Goy is thirsty, he has a couple of pints of beer. But when a Jew is thirsty, he goes and has himself checked for sugar. In the 19th century, the cause of diabetes was unknown. 
then as now, when the doctors don't know what the cause is, they say stress, right? So stress, so they said it was stress. But there were socialist physicians in the 19th century who were trying to bring about occupational change among Jews, who saw diabetes as a consequence, believe it or not, uh, of Jewish over-involvement in commerce, which was believed to be a high stress occupation. If you look at the entry in the Jewish Encyclopedia of 1902, the great multi-volume encyclopedia that came out in, in this country in 1902, there's an entry on diabetes. And in that entry on diabetes, it says, when stocks fall, diabetes rises on Wall Street. Just a remarkable thing to see in the encyclopedia. Um, for many doctors, the peculiar sins of bourgeois life were responsible for the apparently high rate of diabetes among German Jews. Invoking issues of class, gender, and sexuality, one psychiatrist asserted that diabetes is a consequence of a disturbed sexual life. Among West European Jews seeking to attain economic improvement, a psychological victim, namely the modern Jew, has come to the fore, regulating him as sexual abstinence, celibacy, and late marriage. And it's true, Jew, Jews tended to get married, Jewish men tended to get married later than non-Jewish men. They preferred to wait until they were established either professionally or commercially before taking the plunge and starting a family. So that sort of retardation of the process, according to this doctor, manifests itself in Jews leading, Jewish men leading unsatisfied sexual lives. And so in order to compensate for the absence of a normal sex life, they, and I quote the doctor, regress to the feelings of childhood autoeroticism and take delight in that with which their mother satisfied them during childhood with sweets. And thus confectionery becomes a substitute for sex and a cause of diabetes. There are crazy Freudian notions like this, but that can be repeated you know, one, one after the other. But there is an inordinate, uh, apparently an inordinate uh, presence of diabetes in the Jewish population. They were desperate to, to, to uncover the causes of it. And the final one, of course, is insanity. Uh, it was such impressionistic diagnoses as the, that one I just uh, articulated that inspired many in the political and medical worlds to depict Jews as sickly, feminine, and frail at a point that is underscored by their principle uh, pathological trait, and that was nervousness. Real men were not hysterics, and one physician after another at the turn of the century uh, said that the nervousness of Jewish men manifested itself in hypochondria, which in itself was hailed as a women's disorder. And much evidence does indeed go or exist for Jews running to doctors far more quickly than most other ethnic groups. But the search for early inter medical intervention was rarely interpreted as positive. Uh, German Jewish psychiatrists in particular claimed that in the great era of migration beginning in 1881, Jews who were leaving Europe, making their way through Germany and then on their way to England and then further afield to the United States, uh, get to Berlin and uh, they run from one doctor to the next seeking out second and third opinions not stopping until they finally get the one they wanted to hear. And according to one Jewish psychiatrist from Berlin, Hermann Oppenheim, who was a very distinguished psychiatrist, he says, the, project, the progress of this ritual was impeded only by the fact that the Jew generally ran out of money. So despite the indicators that the Jews were a healthy people, they enjoyed the wrong kind of health, for it was considered to be without honor. It was womanly, and this was the Jewish male predicament at the, early, at the turn of the 20th century, where Jewish men were de depicted as ugly or deformed or weak, unheroic, the exact opposite of, the genu of genuine healthy masculinity, that being the Germanic idea. Now, finally, the last category I want to look at here is the social and cultural impact of medicine uh, on German Jewry by the early 20th century. Um, Medicine plays uh, a, an important role in the emergence of a kind of German Jewish self-awareness. The heavy uh, involvement of Jews in German medicine begins in the 19th century when they begin to seek a secular education as their economic status improved. And at the university level, Jews attended in numbers far in excess 
uh, of their proportion of the population. And once there, they expressed a great affinity for the sciences. Um, generally speaking, Jews entered the sciences for three main reasons. One, occupational restrictions in the civil service and the military. Two, science was more open to them. Jews were overwhelmingly middle class, and that was the class that produced most of Germany's scientists. And three, anti-Semitism meant that Jews could not find teaching positions at schools and universities and were channeled into underdeveloped uh, and undeveloped fields of science where they had the opportunity to make novel uh, contributions. And the science or the field of science that most attracted them was medicine. And now this was a, co a cause and a consequence of the fact that Germany was the world's medical leader in the uh, 19th century and into the 20th century. By, not, by 1900, 50% of all the Jews who were at university were there to study medicine. And the presence of Jews in medicine in Germany is truly striking. In 1900, there were about 600,000 Jews in Germany, which means there are about 1% of the population. But they're 16% of all doctors. But if you break it down by city, then the numbers are truly astounding. 50% of all the doctors in Berlin are, are Jewish. 60% of all the doctors in Vienna are Jewish. 67%, you know, if you're keeping score at home, all the dentists in Vienna are Jewish. So um, the overrepresentation of Jews in medicine paved the way for their entrance into the middle classes. It really changed the social economic structure of German Jewry. This gave rise to expressions of envy and outright anti-Semitism by some, but it also had a distinct impact on the social aspirations and values of Jews. So it has an external impact and an internal impact. So systemic, uh, as opposed to um, systemic as opposed to episodic anti-Semitism, generally uh, manifested itself in. Um, charges of malpractice and the denial of professorial appointments to Jews, wherein they were shut out of the more established medical specialties, such as surgery. As for malpractice, uh, take the cholera epidemic of 1892 in Hamburg. The anti-Semitic press had a field day with the cholera epidemic, saying it's more than just a coincidence that the vaccine for cholera is made by Jewish pharmaceutical companies, right? So this is, uh, you know, this was a modern version of sort of a well poisoning charge, uh, but it is absolutely the same thing that if you go on the internet today and spend two seconds typing Jew and COVID, Jews and COVID, the accusation that the Jews are profiting from the vaccination somehow, uh, and perhaps even caused COVID, uh, are rife all over the internet. There's nothing new under the sun. As for professional barriers, the world's most famous doctor, just to give you one example, Sigmund Freud, languished in the rank of unsalaried assistant professor for 17 years. He made a handsome living from his private practice, but at the university. Paul Ehrlich, who won the Nobel Prize for Immunology in 1908, was 60 by the time he was first made a full professor at the University of Frankfurt. Uh, he, he had... Uh, done nothing less than found a cure for syphilis, which was widespread in the 19th century, and he invented, among other things, chemotherapy. Uh, consequently, Jews were forced to move into newer medical specialties, such as internal medicine, gynecology, psychiatry, dermatology, and aesthetic surgery. And here, anti-Semitism actually has a positive impact. They go into these undeveloped fields, and they have the field to themselves. They, they work in these marginal clinics that would have them, uh, institutions that would employ them, and uh, they, uh, they make major contributions. Um, specialization uh, was just in its infancy at the turn of the 20th century. Uh, just at that moment when large numbers of Jews are graduating from medical schools uh, and always inclined to lead new trends before 1933, Jews in Germany were twice as likely to be specialists uh, than non-Jews. Roughly 52% of all Jewish doctors were specialists. The number for German doctors was 26%, so it's double. Uh, and that became grist for the anti-Semites mill, believe it or not. Um, they railed against Jewish physicians for 
their penchant for specialization, claiming that they stood to destroy the holistic character, the kind of Norman Rockwell doctor, you know, treated generations of family members from everything from corns to cancer. Uh, the Jews are now going to sort of, by, by parceling up the body into this specialty and that specialty, they're going to do harm to the holistic nature of German medicine. From an internal perspective, that's from the external, from the internal perspective, it changed, the sheer number of doctors changed the culture and values uh, of uh, German Jewish society. Uh, and the expectations uh, of these young physicians and indeed even their parents begin to change. Whereas at one time, becoming a doctor was a mark of success, they had literally become a dime a dozen in Germany. And so, uh, simply becoming a doctor was insufficient for many. Becoming a professor of medicine was the thing to aim for. And in his memoirs, one Jewish physician uh, it, it talks about the social distinction between the physician and the professor and how it was weighted with tremendous worth in, contempt, in the contemporary Jewish value system. And he wrote as follows, simply put, the physician was valued and respected. However, one looked upon the professor of medicine with unshakable trust and a Jewish mother was especially covetous that their marriageable daughter would form a golden union with a privat docent. A privat docent in German is the functional equivalent of an unsalaried assistant professor. So it would be better from the social standing of German Jewry, rather than marrying a doctor with a successful practice, an unsalaried assistant professor bore with it more yichas, more prestige. So to conclude, Medicine helped facilitate the upward mobility of German Jews, and crucially, it was a source of status that was non-commercial, a fact of special importance, uh, since commercial pursuits were looked upon with disdain in Central European culture. Respected by their patients and financially comfortable, Jewish physicians were able to live the German Jewish dream. After 1933, that dream turned into a nightmare. But up until that time, the intimate relationship between medicine and the German Jews was spectacularly successful. It helped transform the character of German medicine and facilitated the great transformation of German Jewry from a tradition bound community to one that was modern, secular, and a purveyor of scientifically avant garde ideas. So thank you. And we'll leave it there. And. I'll take some questions. Uh, there's one here I see uh, from Jim. Uh, was the propensity for diabetes prevalent in only Western European Jews or did it also occur in Eastern European Jews at a high incidence? Uh, yes. Uh, the, the figure, the, the, the numbers are different for East and Western Europe for everything, for every category that I mentioned, birth rate, death rate, lifespan, um, but they're, they're, uh, but they're in relation to, to their surrounding population, they're much healthier. So in 1900, for example, out of every thousand live births in Russia, because lots of kids are still born, every thousand live births, Jim, uh, 500 Russians die, 500, 500 Russian babies uh, die very shortly after birth. The figure for Jews was 284, so it's sort of half. And you can you can say that about everything. Obviously, out of a thousand births in Germany, uh, there aren't 284 Jews dying, but uh, health conditions are better in Germany than they are in Russia, generally speaking. But everywhere, Jews, from a medical point of view, do not look like their neighbours. And one of the great things about German medicine for someone like me as a historian, uh, uh, you know, I, I don't remember them off the top of my head, but they did figures for Algeria, for all of Europe, for outside of Europe. So we have a really global set of data that we can look to these things. Um, did German Jews die at the same rate uh, as others from the Spanish flu? Uh, Ken, uh, I don't know the answer to that. <laughs> That's the best I could do. I don't, I don't know the answer. Um, 
I was asked by Ada, uh, was it diabetes type one or type two? Uh, that's a great question. Uh, they just kept talking about diabetes. I'm not sure uh, when uh, there was a distinction made, when that, when that discovery was first made. I think that what I'm talking about happened before then. So they just talk about it as, uh, as uh, diabetes. Um, Michael Samuel asks, this is a bit awkward, but why the success of German Jewish doctors' contribution to medicine uh, not to be accepted by the general German and Austrian communities? No, no, no. This is the thing. Uh, in the Middle Ages, even when Jews were expelled from places, princes, bishops, even popes, always kept the Jewish doctor behind. He didn't get chucked out. An exception was made. And in Germany, in the modern period, this was a real issue. If, you, if Jews are 50% of the doctors in Berlin when the Nazis come to power in 1933, it means that they have a hell of a lot of non-Jewish patients. Right? You couldn't survive just you know, with the Jewish clientele. So non-Jews go to Jewish doctors. They, first of all, they have a reputation of being better. Just, that's, that's just popular wisdom. You know? Not necessarily true, but it's popular wisdom. Um, and uh, they, uh, and the thing that's important about medicine, and why medicine is different than every other profession, is because of its intimacy. You can have a Jewish lawyer and a Jewish accountant, but you don't get undressed in front of them. There's, you know, medicine is just different and the relationship is different. So everyone has, so even anti-Semites in Germany who may have even agreed with the Nazis would say things like, he's right about the Jews. Something has to be done about it. But my Jewish doctor, he's a good guy. He's good, I know him. So what happens is this, pretty much everyone is thrown out of their jobs in Germany uh, in 1933, except the Jewish doctors. The doctors go, don't get thrown out until 1938 when they're banned from completely treating, uh, altogether from treating patients in Germany, Christian patients. Why 38? Well, when the Nazis come to power in 33, no Jew entrance to medical school or all, all university is closed off. But 33 to 38 is five years. That's the length of time it takes to get a medical degree. So you train that cohort of German doctors and they're all trained by 1938. You've made up the shortfall because you've taken the Jewish doctors out of circulation by then. And so that five year period, and not only that, but if the Nazis had come, come in in 1933 and had immediately started taking Jewish doctors away from their Christian patients, they knew that they were gonna face a, you know, a, a, uh, a storm of protest. So in order to avert that kind of resistance to the regime, they essentially gradually uh, got rid of Jewish doctors. Um, and so that was an exception among all the professions. That was an exception that for domestic reasons and for the faith that, that people, even people who supported the Nazis had in their particular Jewish doctor, it had to wait until 38. Um, oh, the rest are nice comments about enjoying the lecture. Are there any other questions? Feel free to unmute yourself if you Yeah, can. unmute, unmute, I'm sorry. I'm I, I, have sorry. A funny, I have a cute story. Yeah. Uh, my father was born in Poland in 1905. And my uh -huh. grandfather was a lumber merchant who traveled around you know, in Germany and at, at other places, knew lots of people. Yeah. And during the First World War, uh, a German soldier came to visit 
the family in uh, in Poland. Yeah. And my father had some infection and my grandmother was gonna take him to the Polish doctor and the uh, German soldier said, no, 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 I'm taking him to the German hospital where my father was treated by a German Jewish doctor. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So yeah, it, it was harder to not come in contact with a German Jewish doctor than, than the other way around. They, they were everywhere. They were everywhere. I have a, a they were very ubiquitous. Yeah. A follow up question. So thank yes. you. Um, I've um, been involved with in research on Mount Zion Hospital San Francisco and the fact that after the war during I'm talking World War Two that uh, there was a Jewish hospital founded and after yeah. all, you know, over the United States. My question is, um, in the 19th and early 20th century, were the hospitals, as have been referred to, were they Jewish hospitals or did Jewish doctors have access to the general hospital? Uh, are you, where are you referring to? I'm referring to now to Austria, Germany. Um, oh, no, the, the, well, the there, was a Jewish, there, there was a Jewish hospital in Berlin uh -huh. uh, that, that remained open during the Nazi period, by the way, the Berlin Jewish Hospital. Um, but uh, generally speaking, they were they were not Jewish hospitals. And, right. And, yeah, and, 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 and I also just want to say one thing. I mean, this is the complicated story about German Jewry. When German Jews were uh, at medical schools in such prodigious numbers, right, making up fifty percent of each class, you know, around nineteen hundred. Or between 1880 and you know, 1920, something like that. Um, Jews in the United States couldn't get in. There were restrictions, there were quotas. There's a reason that there are Jewish hospitals all around the United States, because they couldn't get internships. Right. So the Jews said to hell with it, we'll build their own hospitals. So the story of German Jewry is, is uh, complicated and tragic in because it boils down to the question if 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 things were uh, so bad how come things were so good right they rose in german society because german society allowed it german society didn't put quotas on jews going to medical school german society didn't put quotas on jews becoming lawyers German society allowed Jews to become professionals in ways that there were, you know, when at the same time, the United States considered, you know, the, the Golden of Medina, you know, was, was restricting Jews. What happened is, is that the Germans, simply put, had, uh, had buyer's remorse. And uh, they, uh, you know, the success story of German Jewry uh, elicited a backlash. Of the most violent kind, so uh, they could get internships. There were restrictions within the specialties, so some of the specialties they couldn't get into. So some of the newer specialties were really Jewish. So obviously, in specialties that didn't have the kind of respect of the medical establishment. So initially, psychiatry, of course, was one. Another one was dermatology. Because dermatologists early on in the game uh, dealt, you know, to a considerable extent with venereology and various you know, syphilitic disorders and things like that. But by 1933, 90% of all German dermatologists were Jews. That, that specialty is off the charts, but they're new specialties and they're able to make aesthetic surgery. Plastic surgery was a Jewish profession, a Jewish specialty, I should say. So things happened in Germany that were a remarkable stories and remarkably positive until it's not. But it's just, it's worth keeping in, in mind where the restrictions were. You know, when Jews are winning Nobel prizes in Germany, not as Jews, but who, for being very smart doctors and talented doctors, but when they're already winning Nobel prizes, you have Jews from the United States actually going to Germany because they could get into medical school there and not here. So it's, it's, 
worth noting. Yes. So I, I have, this is a very interesting lecture. Thank you very much. Uh, Thank you. Uh, the question is the success of the German of the of the German uh, medical university establishment. Did that attract uh, Ostenjuden from to come there, and did those, or did the German Jewish doctors ever go east uh, to Poland and to the shtetl of the of the? Right. And the question is, uh, you know, because my earlier question had to deal with the success breeding um, uh, some form of. Uh, you know, you, one would believe that success generates warmth, uh, but in this country in recent years, we've noticed, at least I believe, that the success does not generate, uh, may generate contempt as well. Right. Uh, so already by about, uh, by 1900, uh, I said 50% of uh, medical students are Jewish. The majority of those were Jews from Eastern Europe who came to Germany. They even began to uh, outstrip the German Jews. Uh, the percentage, as I said, 50% in Berlin, 60% in Vienna, by the, by the 20s, they're much, much higher in Poland. You're talking 70% in Warsaw, 78% in Lwów, 80% uh, in Vilna, I'm really off the charts. The difference in the story is, for a historian, is that A, it happens in Germany first, that preponderance and that drive, and also the, the larger medical background is that Germany is, and this is what attracts Jews to a great extent too, Germany is the world's medical leader. So you want to be where the action is. Right? So, uh, and whereas Poland and Russia were not. So that the larger medical background is not there in Eastern Europe, but the Jewish story of disproportional presence is so great that they even outstrip the number of German born Jews uh, in medical schools. You, you made a reference to the, the impact of uh, the discussion COVID, uh, the, the Jewish yeah. pharmaceutical company. Does this spill yeah. over into the, the, is there a significant number of Jews within the pharmaceutical, emerging pharmaceutical realm as well? No, there weren't. It was just a lie. Uh, the, the, the Jews were not, the big pharmaceutical companies in Germany already in the you know, 1900 are the ones that are still there. Right. Right, you know them. Uh, they're yeah. not Jewish. Yeah, but, but, but they, they are Herxed, but, you know. But they never. But the Jews never became go went into the pharmaceutical part of the of the of medicine. They they stayed in the so to speak. I mean, just to uh, dichotomize the hands on part. For the most part, I mean, you know, look, you know, you know, one of the anti-Semitic tropes. Well, just generally speaking, not just in Germany, you know, the Jews control the economy. Um, Jews in Germany were solidly middle class for the most part, uh, and, but they were never, they were never in charge of any corporations or really big businesses. Same as in the United States, by the way. Right. Right. There are very few Fortune 500 companies that have Jewish CEOs. Um, but 60% of all German Jews were involved in commerce and commerce tended to be um, a store, small business where the wife worked with the husband very often. Uh, there was commerce, but you know, you can interpret that as, uh, you shouldn't call it commerce. It's a small store. I mean, commerce is really addressing uh, it up. Yeah, um, yeah. But pharmaceuticals, just as a, the major pharmaceutical, I, I won't say that there were Jewish pharmaceutical concerns, but the big ones were not Jewish, no. But that's never stopped an anti-Semite making, making claims. But the same claims, the same claims as you hear today. Israel's behind the vaccine. They'll make a fortune out of it. So they're behind, you know, they're behind uh, spreading the disease and all that kind of stuff. Nothing new under the sun. Any other questions? Okay.
the hour, but thank you so much, everybody, for joining us. And um, if you have any other questions for John, feel free to yep. email me and I'll pass them along to you. And um, we will uh, keep you informed about activities happening at the Center for Jewish Studies, interesting lectures, um, more talks by John coming your way. And uh, we really appreciate the opportunity to spend this hour with you.